Book Four, Part Seven of A Confederate Girl's Diary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Confederate Girl's Diary by Sarah Morgan Dawson. Book Four, Part Seven, July tenth to July twenty third, eighteen sixty three. July tenth. Shall I cry, faint, scream, or go off in hysterics? Tell me which quickly, for to doubt this news is fine and imprisonment, and if I really believe it, I would certainly give way to my feelings and commit some vagaries of the kind. My resolution is formed. I will do neither. I won't gratify the Yankees so much. I have been banging at the piano until my fingers are weary and singing The Secret Through Life to Be Happy. Until my voice is cracked, I'll stand on my head if necessary to prove my indifference. But I'll never believe this is true until it is confirmed by stronger authority. Day before yesterday came tidings that Vicksburg had fallen on the fourth instant. The era poured out extras and sundry little pop guns fizzled out salutes. All who doubted the truth of the report and were brave enough to say so were fined or imprisoned. It has become a penal offence to doubt what the era says. So quite a number of arrests were made. This morning it was followed up by the announcement of the capture of Port Hudson. The guns are pealing for true, and the Yankees at headquarters may be seen skipping like lambs for very joy. And I still disbelieve, skeptic. The first thing I know, that era man will be coming here to convert me, but I don't, can't, won't believe it. If it is true, but I find consolation in this faith: it is either true or not true. If it is true, it is all for the best, and if it is not true, it is better still. Whichever it is, is for some wise purpose. So it does not matter. So we wait, pray, and believe. Five o'clock p.m. I don't believe it. What am I crying about then? It seems so hard. How the mighty are fallen! Port Hudson gone. Brother believes it. That is enough for me. God bless him! I cry hourly. He is so good and considerate. He told me, name your friends and what can be done for them shall be attended to. The prisoners will be sent here. Maybe I cannot do much. But food and clothing you shall have in abundance for them when they arrive. God bless him for his kindness. Oh, dear noble men, I am afraid to meet them. I should do something foolish. Best take my cry out in private now. May the Lord look down in pity on us. Port Hudson does not matter so much, but these brave noble creatures. The era says they had devoured their last mule before they surrendered. Saturday, July tenth, ten o'clock p.m. I preach patience, but how about practice? I am exasperated. There is the simple fact, and is it not enough? What a scene I have just witnessed! A motley crew of thousands of low people of all colors parading the streets with flags, torches, music, and all other accompaniments, shouting, screaming, exulting over the fall of Port Hudson and Vicksburg. The era will call it an enthusiastic demonstration of the loyal citizens of the city. We who saw it from upper balconies know of what rank these citizens were. We saw crowds of soldiers mixed up with the lowest rabble in the town, workingmen in dirty clothes, newsboys, ragged children, negroes, and even women walking in the procession, while swarms of negroes and low white women elbowed each other in a dense mass on the pavement. To see such creatures exulting over our misfortune was enough to make one scream with rage. One of their dozen transparencies was inscribed with a dead confederacy. Fools! The flames are smouldering. They will burst out presently and consume you. More than half, much more, were negroes. As they passed here, they raised a yell of "Down with the rebels!" that made us gnash our teeth in silence. The devil possessed me. O、oh, Miriam, help me pray the dear Lord that their flag may burn. I whispered as the torches danced around it. 
and we did pray earnestly, so earnestly that Miriam's eyes were tightly screwed up, but it must have been a wicked prayer, for it was not answered. Dr. S. has out a magnificent display of black cotton grammatically inscribed with Port Hudson and Vicksburg is ours, garnished with a luminous row of tapers, and drunk on two bits worth of lager beer, he has been shrieking out all union songs he can think of with his horrid children, until my tympanum is perfectly cracked. Miriam wants to offer him an extra bottle of lager for the two places of which he claims the monopoly. He would sell his creed for less. Miriam is dying to ask him what he has done with the Confederate uniform he sported before the Yankees came. His son says they are all Union men over there, and will illuminate, illuminate, to-night. A starving seamstress opposite has stuck six tallow candles in her window. Better put them in her stomach. And I won't believe Vicksburg has surrendered. Port Hudson, I am sure, has fallen— Alas for all hopes of serving the brave creatures, the rumor is that they have been released on parole. Happily for them. But if it must go, what a blessed privilege it would have been to aid or comfort them. Wednesday, July 15th. It is but too true. Both have fallen. All Port Hudson privates have been paroled, and the officers sent here for exchange. Ay, ay, I know some privates I would rather see than the officers. As yet only ten that we know have arrived. All are confined in the custom house. Last evening crowds surrounded the place. We did something dreadful, Ada Pierce, Miriam, and I. We went down to the confectionery, and, unable to resist the temptation, made a detour by the custom house in hope of seeing one of our poor, dear, half-starved, mule- and rat-fed defenders. The crowd had passed away then, but what was our horror when we emerged from the river side of the building and turned into canal to find the whole front of the pavement lined with Yankees? Our folly struck us so forcibly that we were almost paralyzed with fear. However, that did not prevent us from endeavoring to hurry past, though I felt as though walking in a nightmare. Ada was brave enough to look up at a window where several of our prisoners were standing, and kept urging us to do likewise. "'Look, he knows you, Sarah. He has called another to see you. They both recognize you. Oh, look, please, and tell me who they are. They are watching you still,' she would exclaim. "'But if my own dear brother stood there, I could not have raised my eyes.' We only hurried on faster, with a hundred Yankee eyes fixed on our flying steps. My friend Colonel Stedman was one of the commissioners for arranging the terms of the capitulation, I see. He has not yet arrived. Dreadful news has come of the defeat of Lee at Gettysburg. Think I believe it all? He may have been defeated, but not one of these reports of total overthrow and rout do I credit. Yankees jubilant, Southerners dismal. Brother, with principles on one side and brothers on the other, is correspondingly distracted. Saturday, July 18th. It may be wrong. I feel very contrite, but still I cannot help thinking it is an error on the right side. It began by Miriam sending Mr. Kahn a box of cigars when she was on canal the other day, with a note saying we would be delighted to assist him in any way. Poor creature, he wrote an answer which breathed desolation and humility under his present situation in every line. The cigars and unexpected kindness had touched a tender chord, evidently. He said he had no friends and would be grateful for our assistance. But before his answer arrived, yesterday morning I took it into my head that Colonel Stedman was also at the Custom House, though his arrival had not been announced, the Yankees declining to publish any more names to avoid the excitement that follows. So Miriam and I prepared a lunch of chicken, soup, wine, preserves, sardines, and cakes to send to him, and fool-like I sent a note with it, it only contained the same offer of assistance, and I would not object to the town criers reading it, but it upset Brother's ideas of decorum completely. 
He said nothing to Miriam's, because that was the first offence. But yesterday he met Edmund, who was carrying the basket, and he could not stand the sight of another note. I wish he had read it, but he said he would not assume such a right. So he came home very much annoyed and spoke to Miriam about it. Fortunately for my peace of mind I was swimming in the bathtub in blissful unconsciousness, else I should have drowned myself. He said, I want you both to understand that you shall have everything you want for the prisoners. Subscribe any sum of money, purchase any quantity of clothing, send all the food you please, but for God's sake don't write to them. In such a place every man knows the other has received a letter, and none know what it contains. I cannot have my sister's names in everybody's mouth. Never do it again." all as kind and as considerate for us as ever and a necessary caution i love him the better for it but i was dismayed for having rendered the reproof necessary for three hours i made the most hideous faces at myself and groaned aloud over brother's displeasure he is so good that i would rather bite my tongue off than give him a moment's pain just now I went to him, unable to keep silence any longer, and told him how distressed I was to have displeased him about that note. "'Don't think any more about it, only don't do it again, dear,' was his answer. I was so grateful to him for his gentleness that I was almost hurried into a story. I began, "'It is the first time,' when I caught myself and said boldly, no, it is not. Colonel Steadman has written to me before, and I have replied, but I promise to you it shall not occur again if I can avoid it. He was satisfied with the acknowledgment, and I was more than gratified with his kindness. Yet the error must have been on the right side. Colonel Steadman wrote back his thanks by Edmund with heartfelt gratitude for finding such friends in his adversity and touching acknowledgments of the acceptable nature of the lunch. His brother and Colonel Locke were wounded, though recovering, and he was anxious to know if I had yet recovered. And that was all, except that he hoped we would come to see him, and his thanks to brother for his kind message. Brother had sent him word by one of the prisoners that though he was not acquainted with him, yet as his sister's friend he would be happy to assist him if he needed money or clothing. There was no harm in either note, and though I would not do it again, I am almost glad I let him know he still had friends before Brother asked me not to write. And as yet we can't see them. A man was bayoneted yesterday for waving to them even. It only makes us the more eager to see them. We did see some, walking on Rampart Street with the Pierces yesterday in front of a splendid private house, we saw sentinels stationed. Upon inquiry we learned that General Gardner and a dozen others were confined there. Ada and Miriam went wild. If it had not been for dignified Marie and that model of propriety Sarah, there is no knowing but what they would have carried the house by storm. We got them by, without seeing a grey coat, when they vowed to pass back, declaring that the street was not respectable on the block above. We had to follow. So there they all stood on the balcony above. We thought we recognized General Gardner, Major Wilson, Major Spratley, and Mr. Dupre. Miriam was sure she did, but even when I put on a bold face and tried to look, something kept me from seeing, so I had all the appearance of staring without deriving the slightest benefit from it. Wonder what makes me such a fool. Mr. Conn writes that Captain Bradford is wounded, but does not say whether he is here. Thursday, July 23rd. It is bad policy to keep us from seeing the prisoners. It just sets us wild about them. Put a creature you don't care for in the least, in a situation that commands sympathy, and nine out of ten girls will fall desperately in love. Here are brave, self-sacrificing, noble men who have fought heroically for us, and have been forced to surrender by unpropitious fate, confined in a city peopled by their friends and kindred, and as totally isolated from them as though they inhabited the dry tortugas. Ladies are naturally hero-worshippers, 
We are dying to show these unfortunates that we are as proud of their bravery as though it had led to victory instead of defeat. Banks wills that they remain in privacy. Consequently, our vivid imaginations are constantly occupied in depicting their sufferings, privations, heroism, and manifold virtues until they have almost become as demigods to us. Even horrid little Captain C. has a share of my sympathy in his misfortune. Fancy what must be my feelings where those I consider as gentlemen are concerned. It is all I can do to avoid a most tender compassion for a very few select ones. Miriam and I are looked on with envy by other young ladies, because some twenty or thirty of our acquaintance have already arrived. To know a Port Hudson defender is considered as the greatest distinction one need desire. If they would only let us see the prisoners once to sympathize with and offer to assist them, we would never care to call on them again until they are liberated. But this is aggravating. Of what benefit is it to send them lunch after lunch when they seldom receive it? Colonel Stedman and six others, I am sure, did not receive theirs on Sunday. We sent with the baskets a number of cravats and some handkerchiefs I had embroidered for the colonel. Brothers should forbid those gentlemen writing, too. Already a dozen notes have been received from them, and what can we do? We can't tell them not to. Miriam received a letter from Major Spratley this morning, raving about the kindness of the ladies of New Orleans, full of hope of future successes, and vows to help deliver the noble ladies from the hands of their oppressors, etc. It is a wonder that such a patriotic effusion could be smuggled out. He kindly assures us that not only those of our acquaintance there, but all their brother officers, would be more than happy to see us in their prison. Position of affairs rather reversed since we last met. End of Book Four Five, Part One of A Confederate Girl's Diary This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Confederate Girl's Diary by Sarah Morgan Dawson. Book 5, Part 1, August 14th to August 24th, 1863. New Orleans, August 1863. Friday, 14th. Doomed to be bored. Tonight Miriam drags me to a soiree musicale, and in the midst of my toilette I sit down with bare shoulders to scratch a dozen lines in my new treasure, which has been by me for three days untouched. I don't know what tempts me to do it except perversity, for I have nothing to say. I was in hopes that I would never have occasion to refer to the disagreeable subject that occupied the last pages of my old journal, but the hope proves fallacious, and wherever I turn the same subject is renewed, so there is no longer any reason in waiting until all mention can be avoided. Yesterday a little sly, snaky creature asked me if I knew the hero of Port Hudson. Yes, I said briefly. "'Unmistakable! I see it in your face,' she remarked. "'See what?' "'That you betray yourself. Do you know that everyone believes that you are engaged to him?' In surprise I said no. Such a thing had never been mentioned before me until then. "'Well, they say so, and add, too, that you are to be married as soon as the war is over.' "'They are paying me an undeserved compliment,' I returned." Where could such a report have originated? Not certainly from him, and not most assuredly from me. Where does Dame Rumor spring from? He is a stranger here, and I have never mentioned his name except to the Pierces, who would no more report such a thing than I would myself. I won't mind if it does not reach his ears, but what assurance have I that it will not? That would be unpleasant. Why can't they say, let everybody settle their own affairs? Here comes Miriam after me. What a bore, what a bore! And she looks as though it was a pleasure to go out. 
How I hate it! Glancing up the page, the date strikes my eye. What tempted me to begin it Friday? My dear Ada would shiver and declare the blank pages were reserved for some very painful, awful, uncomfortable record, or that something would happen before the end of it. Nothing very exciting can happen except the restoration of peace, and to bring that about I would make a vow to write only on Fridays. Sunday, 16th. Coming out of church this morning with Miriam, a young lady ran up with an important air as though about to create a sensation. "'I have a message for you both,' she said, fixing her eyes on mine as though she sought something in them. "'I visit the prisoners frequently, you know, and day before yesterday Captain Stedman requested me to beg you to call, that he will not take a refusal, but entreated you to come if it were only once.' The fates must be against me. I had almost forgotten his existence, and having received the same message frequently from another, I thoughtlessly said, You mean Colonel, do you not? Fortunately Miriam asked the same question at the instant that I was beginning to believe I had done something very foolish. The lady looked at me with her calm, scrutinizing, disagreeable smile, a smile that had all the unpleasant insinuations eyes and lips can convey, a smile that looked like, I have your secret, you can't deceive me, and said with her piercing gaze, No, not the colonel. He was very ill that day, did you know it, and could not see us. This was really the captain. He is very kind, I stammered, and suggested to Miriam that we had better pass on. The lady was still eyeing me inquisitively. Decidedly, this is unpleasant to have the reputation of being engaged to a man that every girl is crazy to win. If one only cared for him, it would not be so unpleasant. But under the circumstances, ah, sa. Why don't they make him over to the young lady whose father openly avows he would be charmed to have him for a son-in-law? This report has cost me more than one impertinent stare. The young ladies think it a very enviable position. Let some of them usurp it, then. So the young lady, not having finished her examination, proposed to accompany us part of the way. As a recompense, we were regaled with charming little anecdotes about herself and her visits, how she had sent a delightful little custard to the colonel, here was a side glance at my demure face, and had carried an autographic album in her last visit, and had insisted on their inscribing their names, and writing a verse or so. How interesting was my mental comment! Can a man respect a woman who thrusts him her album, begging for a compliment the first time they meet? What fools they must think us if they take such as these for specimens of the genus! Did we know Captain Lanier? Know him? No. But how vividly his face comes before me when I look back to that grand smash-up at Port Hudson, when his face was the last I saw before being thrown, and the first I recognized when I roused myself from my stupor and found myself in the arms of the young Alabamian. At the sound of his name I fairly saw the last ray of sunset flashing over his handsome face, as I saw it then. No, I did not know him. He had spoken to me, begging to be allowed to hold me, and I had answered, entreating him not to touch me, and that was all I knew of him. But she did not wait for the reply. She hurried on to say that she had sent him a bouquet with a piece of poetry, and that he had been heard to exclaim, How beautiful! on reading it. And do you know, she continued, with an air that was meant to be charmingly naif, but which was not very successful, as naivete at twenty-nine is rather flat, I am so much afraid he thinks it original. I forgot to put quotation marks, and it would be so funny in him to make the mistake. For you know I have not much of the, of that sort of thing about me. I am not a poet, poetess, author, you know said Miriam in her blandest tone, without a touch of sarcasm in her voice, "'Oh, if he has ever seen you, the mistake is natural.' 
If I had spoken, my voice would have carried a sting in it. So I waited until I could calmly say, You know him well, of course. No, I never saw him before, she answered, with a new outburst of naivete. Monday, August 24th. A letter from Captain Bradford to Miriam. My poor Adonis, that I used to ridicule so unmercifully, what misfortunes have befallen him? He writes that during the siege at Port Hudson he had the top of his ear shot off. Wonder if he lost any of that beautiful golden fleece eclept his hair, and had the cap of his knee removed by a shell, besides a third wound he does not specify. Fortunately he is with kind friends, and he gives news of Lydia, most acceptable since such a time has elapsed since we heard from her. He says, Tell Miss Sarah that the last I saw of John he was crossing the Mississippi in a skiff, his parole in his pocket, his sweet little sister by his side. Oh, you wretch, at it again, and somebody else in his heart. How considerate to volunteer the last statement. Then followed half a page of commendation for his bravery, daring, and skill during the siege, the only kind word he ever spoke of him, I dare say, all looking as though I was to take it as an especial compliment to myself, and was expected to look foolish, blush, and say thank ye for it, as though I care. Monday night. I consider myself outrageously imposed upon— I am so indignant that I have spent a whole evening making faces at myself. Please, Miss Sarah, look natural, William petitions. I never saw you look cross before. Good reason. I never had more cause. However, I stop in the midst of a hideous grimace and join in a game of hide the switch with the children to forget my annoyance. Of course a woman is at the bottom of it. Last night, while Ada and Marie were here, a young lady whose name I declined to reveal for the sake of the sex, stopped at the door with an English officer, and asked to see me in the entry. I had met her once before. Remember this, for that is the chief cause of my anger. Of course they were invited in, but she declined, saying she had but a moment, and had a message to deliver to me alone, so led me apart. "'Of course you know who it is from,' she began. I told a deliberate falsehood, and said no, though I guessed instantly. She told me the name then. She had visited the prison the day before, and there had met an individual whose name, joined to mine, has given me more trouble and annoyance during the last few months than it would be possible to mention.' "'And our entire conversation was about you,' she said, as though to flatter my vanity immensely. He told her then that he had written repeatedly to me without receiving an answer, and at last had written again, in which he had used some expressions which he feared had offended my reserved disposition. Something had made me angry, for without returning letter or message to say I was not displeased, I had maintained a resolute silence, which had given him more pain and uneasiness than he could say. That during all this time he had had no opportunity of explaining it to me, and that now he begged her to tell me that he would not offend me for worlds, that he admired me more than any one he had ever met, that he could not help saying what he did, but was distressed at offending me, etc. The longest explanation! And she was directed to beg me to explain my silence, and let him know if I was really offended, and also leave no entreaty or argument untried to induce me to visit the prison. He must see me. As to visiting the prison, I told her that was impossible. Oh, how glad I am that I never did! but as to the letters, told her to assure him that I had not thought of them in that light, and had passed over the expressions he referred to as idle words it would be ridiculous to take offence at, and that my only reason for persevering in this silence had been that brother disapproved of my writing to gentlemen, and I had promised that I would not write to him, 
that I had feared he would misconstrue my silence and had wished to explain it to him, but I had no means of doing so except by breaking my promise, and so had preferred leaving all explanation to time and some future opportunity. "'But you did not mean to pain him, did you?' the dear little creature coaxingly lisped, standing on tiptoe to kiss me as she spoke. I assured her that I had not. "'He has been dangerously ill,' she continued apologizingly, "'and sickness has made him more morbid and more unhappy about it "'than he would otherwise have been. "'It has distressed him a great deal.' "'I felt awkwardly. "'How was it that this girl, meeting him for the first and only time in her life, "'had contrived to learn so much that she had no right to know, "'and appeared here as mediator between two who were strangers to her, "'so far usurping a place she was not entitled to, "'as to apologize to me for his sensitiveness, "'and to entreat me to tell him he had not forfeited my esteem, "'as though she was his most intimate friend, and I a past acquaintance. Failing to comprehend it, I deferred it to a leisure moment to think over, and in the meantime exerted myself to be affable. I can't say half she spoke of, but as she was going she said, "'Then will you give me permission to say as many sweet things for you as I can think of? I'm going there to-morrow.' I told her I would be afraid to give her carte blanche on such a subject, but that she would really oblige me by explaining about the letters. She promised, and after another kiss and a few whispered words, left me. Maybe she exaggerated, though. Uncharitable as the supposition was, it was a consolation. I was unwilling to believe that any one who professed to esteem me would make me the subject of conversation with a stranger, and such a conversation. So my comfort was only in hoping that she had related a combination of truth and fiction, and that he had not been guilty of such folly. Presently it grew clearer to me. I must be growing in wickedness to fathom that of others, I who so short a time ago disbelieved in the very existence of such a thing. I remembered having heard that the young lady and her family were extremely anxious to form his acquaintance, and that her cousin had coolly informed Ada that she had selected him among all others, and meant to have him for a beau as soon as she could be introduced to him. I remembered that the young lady herself had been very anxious to discover whether the reputation common report had given me had any foundation. As soon as we were alone I told mother of our conversation in the entry, and said, "'And now I am certain that this girl has made use of my name to become acquainted with him.'" End of Book 5, Part 1《Part Two of a Confederate Girl's Diary》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Please visit LibriVox.org. A Confederate Girl's Diary by Sarah Morgan Dawson. Book Five, Part Two, September tenth to December thirty first, eighteen sixty three. Thursday, tenth September. O oh, my prophetic soul, part of your forebodings are already verified, and in what an unpleasant way. Day before yesterday an English officer, not the one who came here but one totally unknown to me, said at Mrs. Pierce's he was going to visit the Confederate prisoners. He was asked if he knew any. Slightly, he said, but he was going this time by request. He had any quantity of messages to deliver to Colonel Blank from Miss Sarah Morgan. How can that be possible, since you are not acquainted with her, Ada demanded? He had the impudence to say that the young lady I have already mentioned had requested him to deliver them for her, since she found it impossible. Fortunately for me, I have two friends left. Feeling the indelicacy of the thing, and knowing that there must be some mistake that might lead to unpleasant consequences, Ada and Marie, my good angels, insisted on hearing the messages. 
At first he refused, saying that they were entrusted to him confidentially, but being assured that they were really intimate with me, whereas the other was a perfect stranger, and that I would certainly not object to their hearing what I could tell a gentleman, he yielded, fortunately for my peace of mind, and told all. I can't repeat it. I was too horrified to hear all when they told me. What struck me as being most shocking was my distorted explanation about the letters. It now set forth that I was not allowed to write myself, but would be happy to have him write to me. Then there was an earnest assurance that my feelings toward him had not changed in the least. Here I sprang from my chair and rushed to the window for a breath of air, wringing my hands in speechless distress. How a word more or less, an idea omitted or added, a syllable misplaced, can transform a whole sentence and make what was before harmless really shocking. And if it had not been for Ada and Marie, blessed angels, they entreated him not to deliver any of his messages, insisting that there must be a mistake, that if he knew me he would understand that it was impossible for me to have sent such a message by a stranger. And although at first he declared he felt obliged to discharge the task imposed on him, they finally succeeded in persuading him to relinquish the errand, promising to be responsible for the consequences. "'Ah, me!' I gasped last night, making frantic grimaces in the dark and pinching myself in disgust. "'Why can't they let me alone? Oh, women, women, I wish he could marry all of you so you would let me alone. Take him, please, but en grâce don't disgrace me in the excitement of the race.' Friday, 25th. Write me down a witch, a prophetess, or what you will. I am certainly something. All has come to pass on that very disagreeable subject, very much as I feared. Perhaps no one in my position would speak freely on the subject. For that very reason I shall not hesitate to discuss it. Know then that this morning he went north along with many other Confederate prisoners to be exchanged, and he left, he who has written so incessantly and so imploringly for me to visit his prison, he left without seeing me. Bon, wonder what happened. Evening. I have learned more. He has not yet left. Part of the mystery is unraveled, only I have neither patience nor desire to seek for more. These women. Hush, to slander is too much like them. Be yourself. My sweet little lisper informed a select circle of friends the other night, when questioned, that the individual had not called on me, and what was more would not do so. Pray, how do you happen to be so intimately acquainted with the affairs of two who are strangers to you? asked a lady present. She declined saying how she had obtained her information, only asserting that it was so. In fact, you cannot expect any Confederate gentleman to call at the house of Judge Morgan a professed Unionist, she continued. So that is the story she told to keep him from seeing me. She has told him that we had turned Yankees. All her arts would not grieve me as much as one word against brother. My wrongs I can forget, but one word of contempt for brother I never forgive. White with passion, I said to my informant, Will you inform the young lady that her visit will never be returned, that she is requested not to repeat hers, and that I decline knowing any one who dares cast the slightest reflection on the name of one who has been both father and brother to me? This evening I was at a house where she was announced. Miriam and I bade our hostess good evening and left without speaking to her. Anybody but brother. No one shall utter his name before me save with respect and regard. This young woman's father is a captain in the Yankee Navy, and her brother is a captain in the Yankee Army, while three other brothers are in the Confederate. Like herself, I have three brothers fighting for the South. Unlike her, the only brother who avows himself a Unionist has too much regard for his family to take up arms against his own flesh and blood. Tuesday, October 6th. I hope this will be the last occasion on which I shall refer to the topic to which this unfortunate book seems to have been devoted. But it gives me a grim pleasure to add a link to the broken chain of the curious story now and then. 
Maybe some day the missing links will be supplied me, and then I can read the little humdrum romance of what might have been, or what I'm glad never was, as easily as Marie tells her rosary. Well, the prisoners have gone at last, to my unspeakable satisfaction. Day before yesterday they left. Now I can go out as I please without fear of meeting him face to face. How odd that I should feel like a culprit! but that is in accordance with my usual judgment and consistency. Friday I had a severe fright. Coming up Camp Street with Ada, after a ramble on Canal, we met two Confederates. Everywhere that morning we had met gray coats, but none I recognized. Still, without looking, I saw through my eyelids, as it were, two hands timidly touched two gray caps, as though the question, may I, had not yet been answered. In vain I endeavored to meet their eyes or give the faintest token of greeting. I was too frightened and embarrassed to speak, and only by a desperate effort succeeded in bending my head in a doubtful bow that would have disgraced a dairy-maid after we had passed. Then, disgusted with myself, I endeavored to be comforted with the idea that they had perhaps mistaken me for someone else, that having known me at a time when I was unable to walk, they could have no idea of my height and figure or walk. So I reasoned, turning down a side street. Lo, at a respectable distance they were following. We had occasion to go into a daguerreo salon. While standing in the light, two gray uniforms, watching us from the dark recess at the door, attracted my attention. Pointing them out to Ada, I hurried her past them downstairs to the street. Faster and faster we walked, until at the corner I turned to look. There they were again, sauntering leisurely along. We turned into another street, mingled in the crowd, and finally lost sight of them. That fright lasted me an hour or two. Whose purse have I stolen that I am afraid to look these men in the face? But what has this to do with what I meant to tell? How loosely and disconnectedly my ideas run out with the ink from my pen. I meant to say how sorry I am for my dear little lisper that she failed in her efforts to conquer the hero, and here I have drifted off in a page of trash that does not concern her in the least." Well, she did not succeed, and whatever she told him was in vain as far as she was concerned. He was not to be caught. What an extraordinary man! Dozens fighting for the preference, and he in real or pretended ignorance. I must do him the justice to say he is the most guileless as well as the most honest of mortals. He told the mother of a rich and pretty daughter what he thought of me, that my superior did not exist on earth, and my equal he had never met. Ha, ha, this pathetic story makes me laugh in spite of myself. Is it an excess of innocence or just a role he adopted? Stop, his idle word is as good as an oath. He could not pretend what he did not believe. He told her of his earnest and sincere admiration. Words, words, hurry on. She asked how it was, then. Here he confessed with a mixture of pride and penitence that he had written me letters which absolutely required answers, and to which I had never deigned to reply by even a word. That mortified beyond measure at my silent contempt, he had tried every means of ascertaining the cause of my coldness, but I had never vouchsafed an answer, but had left him to feel the full force of my harsh treatment without one word of explanation, that when he was paroled he had hoped that I would see him to tell him wherein he had forfeited my esteem but I had not invited him to call, and mortified and repulsed as he had been, it was impossible for him to call without my permission. Did my little lisper change the message when the little midshipman told her it had been intercepted because too friendly? I know she met this martyred lion frequently after that, and had many opportunities of telling him the simple truth, but evidently she did not. He has gone away with sorely wounded feelings, to say nothing more. For that I am sincerely sorry, 
but I trust to his newly acquired freedom and his life of danger and excitement to make him forget the wrongs he believes himself to have suffered at my hands. If it was all to be gone through again, which, thank heaven, I will never be called upon to endure again, I would follow brother's advice as implicitly then as I did before. He is right, and without seeing, I believe. They tell me of his altered looks, of his forced, reckless gaiety, which, so strangely out of keeping with his natural character, but makes his assumed part more conspicuous. No matter. He will recover. Nothing like a sea voyage for disorders of all kinds. And we will never meet again. That is another consolation. Notice. The public are hereby informed through Mrs. Blank, chief manager of the Theatre of High Tragedy, that Miss Sarah M., having been proved unworthy and incompetent to play the role of Ariadne, said part will hereafter be filled by Miss Blank of Blank Street, who plays it with a fidelity so true to nature that she could hardly be surpassed by the original. Monday, November 9th. Another odd link of the old stale story has come to me all the way from New York. A friend of mine who went on the same boat with the prisoners wrote to her mother to tell her that she had formed the acquaintance of the most charming, fascinating gentleman among them, no other than my once friend. Of course she would have been less than a woman if she had not gossiped when she discovered who he was. So she sends me word that he told her he had been made to believe, as long as he was on parole in New Orleans, that we were all Unionists now, and that Brother would not allow a Confederate to enter the house. Oh, my little lisper, was I unjust to you? He told her that I had been very kind to him when he was in prison, and he would have forgotten the rest, and gladly have called to thank me in person for the kindness he so gratefully remembered, if I alone had been concerned. But he felt he could not force himself unasked into my brother's house. She told him how false it was. Sunday, November 22nd. A report has just reached us that my poor dear Gibbs has been taken prisoner along with the rest of Hayes's brigade. November 26th. Yes, it is so if his own handwriting is any proof. Mr. Appleton has just sent Brother a letter he had received from Gibbs, asking him to let Brother know he was a prisoner, and we have heard through someone else that he had been sent to Sandusky. Brother has applied to have him paroled and sent here, or even imprisoned here, if he cannot be paroled. Monday, November 30th. Our distress about Gibbs has been somewhat relieved by good news from Jimmy. The jolliest sailor letter from him came this morning, dated only the fourth instant, from Cherbourg, detailing his cruise on the Georgia from leaving England to Bahia, Trinidad, Cape of Good Hope, to France again. Such a bright, dashing letter! We laughed extravagantly over it when he told how they readily evaded the Vanderbilt, knowing she would knock them into pie how he and the French captain quarrelled when he ordered him to show his papers, and how he did not know French abuse enough to enter into competition with him, so went back a first and second time to Maury when the man would not let him come aboard, whereupon Maury brought the ship to with two or three shots, and Jimmy made a third attempt, and forced the Frenchman to show his papers. He tells it in such a matter-of-fact way, no extravagance, no idea of having been in a dangerous situation, he a boy of eighteen on a French ship in spite of the captain's rage. What a jolly life it must be, now dashing in storms and danger, now floating in sunshine and fun. Wish I was a midshipman. Then how he changes in describing the prize with an assorted cargo that they took, which contained all things from a needle to pianos, from the reckless spurt in which he speaks of the plundering, to where he tells of how the captain, having died several days before, was brought on the Georgia while Maury read the service over the body and consigned it to the deep by the flames of the dead man's own vessel. 
What noble, tender, manly hearts it shows, those rough seamen stopping in their work of destruction to perform the last rites over their dead enemy. One can fancy their bare heads and sunburned faces standing in solemn silence around the poor dead man when he dropped into his immense grave. God bless the pirates! Thursday night, December 31st, 1863. The last of 1863 is passing away as I write. Every new year since I was in my teens I have sought a quiet spot where I could whisper to myself Tennyson's Death of the Old Year, and even this bitter cold night I steal into my freezing, fireless little room, en robe de nuit, to keep up my old habit while the others sleep. Old year, you shall not die. We did so laugh and cry with you. I've half a mind to die with you, old year, if you must die. No, go and welcome. Bring peace and brighter days, O dawning new year. Die faster and faster, old one. I count your remaining moments with almost savage glee. End of Book Five, Part Two Part three of a Confederate Girl's Diary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Confederate Girl's Diary by Sarah Morgan Dawson. Book five, part three, February third, eighteen sixty four to June fifteenth, eighteen sixty five. Wednesday, February 3rd. Last night we were thrown into the most violent state of commotion by the unexpected entrance of Captain Bradford. He has been brought here a prisoner from Asphodel, where he has been ever since the surrender of Port Hudson, and taking advantage of his tri-weekly parole, his first visit was naturally here, as he has no other friends." poor creature how he must have suffered the first glance at his altered face where suffering and passion have both left their traces unmistakably since we last met and the mere sight of his poor lame leg filled my heart with compassion how he hates mr halsey i could not forego the pleasure of provoking him into a discussion about him knowing how they hated each other he would not say anything against him understand that as a gentleman and a companion mr halsey was his warmest and best friend there was no one he admired more but he must say that as a soldier he was the worst he had ever seen not that he was not as brave and gallant a man as ever lived but he neglected his duties most shamefully while visiting linwood so constantly eluding the sentinels daily as he asked for neither pass nor permission and consulting only his inclinations instead of his superior officers or his business. And that last night at Linwood, when he absented himself without leave, why could he not have signified to him, his captain, that he wished to say good-bye, instead of quietly doing as he pleased? When the colonel sent for a report of the number of men, quantity of forage and ammunition, etc., and it was discovered that John Halsey was absent without leave, with the books locked up and the keys in his pocket, even after this lapse of time the fire flashed through the ice as the captain spoke. Sergeant Halsey, I am sorry for you when you reported yourself next day. All the fun that could have been crowded into an evening at Linwood could not have repaid you for the morning scene. And after all, what was it beyond very empty pleasure with a great deal of laughter? He could have dispensed with it just as well. Looking back, I congratulate myself on being the only one who did not ask him to stay. Fifth. Not dead. Not dead. Oh, my God, Gibbs is not dead. Where? Oh, dear God, another? Only a few days ago came a letter so cheerful and hopeful. We have waited and prayed so patiently. At my feet lies one from Colonel Steadman saying he is dead. Dead, suddenly and without a moment's warning, summoned to God. 
"'No, it cannot be. I am mad. Oh, God, have mercy on us, my poor mother, and Lydia, Lydia, God comfort you. My brain seems afire. Am I mad? Not yet. God would not take him yet. He will come again. Hush, God is good. Not dead, not dead. Oh, Gibbs, come back to us.' Eleventh. O oh God, O oh God, have mercy on us. George is dead, both in a week. George, our sole hope, our sole dependence. March. Dead, dead, both dead. O oh, my brothers, what have we lived for except you? We who would have so gladly laid down our lives for yours are left desolate to mourn over all we loved and hoped for, weak and helpless while you, so strong, noble, and brave, have gone before us without a murmur. God knows best, but it is hard, oh so hard, to give them up. If we had had any warning or preparation, this would not have been so unspeakably awful, but to shut one's eyes to all dangers and risks, and drown every rising fear with God will send them back, I will not doubt his mercy, and then suddenly to learn that your faith has been presumption, and God wills that you shall undergo bitter affliction. It is a fearful awakening. What glory have we ever rendered to God that we should expect him to be so merciful to us? Are not all things his, and is not he infinitely more tender and compassionate than we deserve? We have deceived ourselves willfully about both. After the first dismay on hearing of Gibbs's capture, we readily listened to the assertions of our friends that Johnson's Island was the healthiest place in the world, that he would be better off comfortably clothed and under shelter than exposed to shot and shell, half fed and lying on the bare ground during Ewell's winter campaign. We were thankful for his safety, knowing Brother would leave nothing undone that could add to his comfort. And besides that, there was the sure hope of his having him paroled. On that hope we lived all winter, now confident that in a little while he would be with us, then again doubting for a while, only to have the hope grow surer afterwards. And so we waited and prayed, never doubting he would come at last. He himself believed it, though striving not to be too hopeful lest he should disappoint us as well as himself. Yet he wrote cheerfully and bravely to the last. Towards the middle of January Brother was sure of succeeding, as all the prisoners had been placed under Butler's control. Ah, me, how could we be so blind? We were sure he would be with us in a few weeks. I wrote to him that I had prepared his room. On the 30th of January came his last letter, addressed to me, though meant for Lavinia. It was dated the 12th, the day George died. All his letters pleaded that I would write more frequently. He loved to hear from me, so I had been writing to him every ten days. On the 3rd of February I sent my last. Friday the 5th, as I was running through Miriam's room, I saw Brother pass the door, and heard him ask Miriam for Mother. The voice, the bowed head, the look of utter despair on his face, struck through me like a knife. Gibbs, Gibbs was my sole thought, but Miriam and I stood motionless looking at each other without a word. Gibbs is dead, said Mother, as he stood before her. He did not speak, and then we went in. We did not ask how or when. That he was dead was enough for us. But after a while he told us Uncle James had written that he had died at two o'clock on Thursday the 21st. Still we did not know how he had died. Several letters that had been brought remained unopened on the floor. One brother opened, hoping to learn something more. It was from Colonel Steadman to Miriam and me, written a few hours after his death, and contained the sad story of our dear brother's last hours. He had been in Colonel Steadman's ward of the hospital for more than a week, with headache and sore throat, but it was thought nothing. He seemed to improve, and expected to be discharged in a few days. 
On the 21st he complained that his throat pained him again. After prescribing for him and talking cheerfully with him for some time, Colonel Steadman left him surrounded by his friends to attend to his other patients. He had hardly reached his room when someone ran to him saying Captain Morgan was dying. He hurried to his bedside and found him dead. Captain Steadman, sick in the next bed, and those around him, said he had been talking pleasantly with them when he sat up to reach his cup of water on the table. As soon as he drank it he seemed to suffocate, and after tossing his arms wildly in the air and making several fearful efforts to breathe, he died. "'Hush, mother, hush,' I said when I heard her cries. "'We have brother and George and Jimmy left, and Lydia has lost all.' Heaven pity us, George had gone before. Only he and Mercy kept the knowledge of it from us for a while longer. On Thursday the 11th, as we sat talking to mother, striving to make her forget the weary days we had cried through with that fearful sound of dead— dead, ringing ever in our ears, someone asked for Miriam. She went down, and presently I heard her thanking somebody for a letter. You could not have brought me anything more acceptable. It is from my sister, though she can hardly have heard from us yet. I ran back, and, sitting at mother's feet, told her Miriam was coming with a letter from Lydia. Mother cried at the mention of her name. Oh, my little sister, you know how dear you are to us. Mother, mother, a horrible voice cried, and before I could think who it was, Miriam rushed in, holding an open letter in her hand, and perfectly wild. George is dead, she shrieked, and fell heavily to the ground. Oh, my God, I could have prayed thee to take mother, too, when I looked at her. I thought— I almost hoped she was dead, and that pang spared, but I was wild myself. I could have screamed, laughed. It is false, do you hear me, mother? God would not take both. George is not dead, I cried, trying in vain to arouse her from her horrible state, or bring one ray of reason to her eye. I spoke to a body alive only to pain. Not a sound of my voice seemed to reach her. Only fearful moans showed she was yet alive. Miriam lay raving on the ground. Poor Miriam, her heart's idol torn away. God help my darling. I did not understand that George could die until I looked at her. In vain I strove to raise her from the ground or check her wild shrieks for death. George, only George, she would cry until at last, with the horror of seeing both die before me, I mastered strength enough to go for the servant and bid her run quickly for brother. How long I stood there alone I never knew. I remember Ada coming in hurriedly and asking what it was. I told her George was dead. It was a relief to see her cry. I could not, but I felt the pain afresh, as though it were her brother she was crying over, not mine and the sight of her tears brought mine, too. We could only cry over mother and Miriam. We could not rouse them. We did not know what to do. Someone called me in the entry. I went, not understanding what I was doing. A lady came to me, told me her name, and said something about George, but I could not follow what she said. It was as though she was talking in a dream. I believe she repeated the word several times, for at last she shook me and said, Listen, rouse yourself, the letter is about George. Yes, I said, he is dead. She said I must read the letter, but I could not see, so she read it aloud. It was from Dr. Mitchell, his friend who was with him when he died, telling of his sickness and death. He died on Tuesday, the 12th of January, after an illness of six days, conscious to the last, and awaiting the end as only a Christian, and one who has led so beautiful a life, could with the grace of God look for it. 
He sent messages to his brothers and sisters, and bade them tell his mother his last thoughts were of her, and that he died trusting in the mercy of the Saviour. George, our pride, our beautiful angel brother, could he die? Surely God has sent all these afflictions within these three years to teach us that our hopes must be placed above, and that it is blasphemy to have earthly idols. The letter said that the physicians had mistaken his malady, which was inflammation of the bowels, and he had died from being treated for something else. It seemed horrible cruelty to read me that part. I knew that if Mother or Miriam ever heard of it, it would kill them, so I begged Mrs. Mitchell never to let them hear of it. She seemed to think nothing of the pain it would inflict. How could she help telling if they asked, she said. I told her I must insist on her not mentioning it. It would only add suffering to what was already insupportable. If they asked for the letter, offer to read it aloud, but say positively that she would not allow anyone to touch it except herself, and then she might pass it over in silence. I roused Miriam then, and sent her to hear it read. She insisted on reading it herself, and, half dead with grief, held out her hands, begging piteously to be suffered to read it alone. I watched then until I was sure Mrs. Mitchell would keep her promise. Horrible as I knew it to be from strange lips, I knew by what I experienced that I had saved her from a shock that might cost her her life. And then I went back to mother. No need to conceal what I felt there. She neither spoke nor saw. If I had shrieked that he died of ill-treatment, she would not have understood. But I sat there silently with that horrible secret, wondering if God would help me bear it, or if despair would deprive me of self-control and force me presently to cry it aloud, though it should kill them both. At last brother came. I had to meet him downstairs and tell him. God spare me the sight of a strong man's grief. Then sister came in, knowing as little as he. Poor sister, I could have blessed her for every tear she shed. It was a comfort to see someone who had life or feeling left. I felt as though the whole world was dead. Nothing was real, nothing existed except horrible, speechless pain. Life was a fearful dream through which but one thought ran. Dead. Dead. Miriam had been taken to her room more dead than alive. Mother lay speechless in hers. The shock of this second blow had obliterated with them all recollection of the first. It was a mercy I envied them, for I remembered both, until loss of consciousness would have seemed a blessing. I shall never forget Mother's shriek of horror when towards evening she recalled it. Oh, those dreadful days of misery and wretchedness! It seems almost sacrilege to refer to them now. They are buried in our hearts with our boys, thought of with prayers and tears. How will the world seem to us now? What will life be without the boys? When this terrible strife is over, and so many thousands return to their homes, what will peace bring us of all we hoped? Jimmy, dear Lord, spare us that one. November 2nd, 1864 This morning we heard Jimmy is engaged to Helen Trenholm, daughter of the Secretary of the Confederate States. He wrote asking brother's consent, saying they had been engaged since August, though he had had no opportunity of writing until that day, the middle of September. I cried myself blind. It seems that our last one is gone. But this is the first selfish burst of feeling. Later I shall come to my senses and love my sister that is to be. But my darling, my darling, oh, Jimmy, how can I give you up? You have been so close to me since Harry died. Alone now best so. Number 19 Dauphine Street, Saturday night, December 31st, 1864. 
One year ago, in my little room in the Camp Street house, I sat shivering over Tennyson and my desk, selfishly rejoicing over the departure of a year that had brought pain and discomfort only to me, and eagerly welcoming the dawning of the new one, whose first days were to bring death to George and Gibbs, and whose latter part was to separate me from Miriam, and bring me news of Jimmy's approaching marriage. O oh, sad, dreary, fearful old year, I see you go with pain. Bitter as you have been, how do we know what the coming one has in store for us? What new changes will it bring? Which of us will it take? I am afraid of 1865, and have felt a vague dread of it for several years past. Nothing remains as it was a few months ago. Miriam went to Lily in the Confederacy on the 19th of October. Ah, Miriam! And Mother and I have been boarding with Mrs. Postlethwaite ever since. I miss her sadly, not as much, though, as I would were I less engaged, for since the first week in August I have been teaching the children for sister, and since we have been here I go to them every morning instead of their coming to me. Starting out at half-past eight daily, and returning a little before three, does not leave me much time for melancholy reflections, and there is no necessity for indulging in them at present. They only give pain. Number 211 Camp Street, April 19, 1865 Quote, All things are taken from us and become portions and parcels of the dreadful past. End quote. Thursday the 13th came the dreadful tidings of the surrender of Lee and his army on the 9th. Everybody cried, but I would not, satisfied that God will still save us, even though all should apparently be lost. Followed at intervals of two or three hours by the announcement of the capture of Richmond, Selma, Mobile, and Johnston's army, even the staunchest Southerners were hopeless. Everyone proclaimed peace, and the only matter under consideration was whether Jeff Davis, all politicians, every man above the rank of captain in the army and above that of lieutenant in the navy, should be hanged immediately, or some graciously pardoned. Henry Ward Beecher humanely pleaded mercy for us, supported by a small minority. Davis and all the leading men must be executed. The blood of the others would serve to irrigate the country. Under this lively prospect, peace, blessed peace, was the cry. I whispered, never, let a great earthquake swallow us up first. Let us leave our land and emigrate to any desert spot of the earth, rather than return to the Union, even as it was. Six days this has lasted. Blessed with the silently obstinate disposition, I would not dispute, but felt my heart swell, repeating, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in time of trouble, and could not for an instant believe this could end in an overthrow. This morning, when I went down to breakfast at seven, Brother read the announcement of the assassination of Lincoln and Secretary Seward. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. This is murder. God have mercy on those who did it. Charlotte Corday killed Marat in his bath and is held up in history as one of Liberty's martyrs and one of the heroines of her country. To me it is all murder. Let historians extol bloodshedding, it is woman's place to abhor it. And because I know that they would have apotheosized any man who had crucified Jeff Davis, I abhor this and call it foul murder, unworthy of our cause. And God grant it was only the temporary insanity of a desperate man that committed this crime. Let not his blood be visited on our nation, Lord." Across the way, a large building, undoubtedly inhabited by officers, is being draped in black. Immense streamers of black and white hang from the balcony. Downtown, I understand, all shops are closed and all wrapped in mourning. 
and I hardly dare pray God to bless us with the crepe hanging over the way. It would have been banners if our president had been killed, though. Saturday, 22nd April. To see a whole city draped in mourning is certainly an imposing spectacle, and becomes almost grand when it is considered as an expression of universal affliction. So it is in one sense, for the more violently secesh the inmates, the more thankful they are for Lincoln's death, the more profusely the houses are decked with emblems of woe. They all look to me like not sorry for him, but dreadfully grieved to be forced to this demonstration. So all things have indeed assumed a funereal aspect, men who have hated Lincoln with all their souls, under terror of confiscation and imprisonment which they understand is the alternative, tie black crape from every practicable knob and point to save their homes. Last evening the bees were all in tears preparing their mourning. What sensibility, what patriotism a stranger would have exclaimed! But Bella's first remark was, Is it not horrible, this vile, vile old crape? Think of hanging it out when... Tears of rage finished the sentence. One would have thought pity for the murdered man had very little to do with it. Coming back in the cars, I had a rencontre that makes me gnash my teeth yet. It was after dark, and I was the only lady in a car crowded with gentlemen. I placed little Miriam on my lap to make room for some of them, when a great dark man, all in black, entered, and took the seat and my left hand at the same instant, saying, "'Good evening, Miss Sarah.' Frightened beyond measure to recognize Captain Todd, note, a cousin of Mrs. Lincoln, of the Yankee army in my interlocutor. I, however, preserved a quiet exterior, and without the slightest demonstration answered, as though replying to an internal question, Mr. Todd. It is a long while since we met, he ventured. Four years, I returned mechanically. You have been well? My health has been bad. I have been ill myself, and, determined to break the ice, he diverged with, Baton Rouge has changed sadly. I hope I shall never see it again. We have suffered too much to recall home with any pleasure. I understand you have suffered severely, he said, glancing at my black dress. We have yet one left in the army, though, I could not help saying. He, too, had a brother there, he said. He pulled the check-string as we reached the house, adding, This is it, and absurdly correcting himself with, Where do you live? Two eleven. I thank you. Good evening. The last with emphasis as he prepared to follow. He returned the salutation, and I hurriedly regained the house. Monsieur stood over the way. A look through the blinds showed him returning to his domicile several doors below. I returned to my own painful reflections. The Mr. Todd, who was my sweetheart when I was twelve and he twenty-four, who was my brother's friend and daily at our home, was put away from among our acquaintance at the beginning of the war. This one I should not know. Cords of candy and mountains of bouquets bestowed in childish days will not make my country's enemy my friend, now that I am a woman." Tuesday, May 2nd, 1865. While praying for the return of those who have fought so nobly for us, how I have dreaded their first days at home. Since the boys died, I have constantly thought of what pain it would bring to see their comrades return without them, to see families reunited, and know that ours never could be again save in heaven." Last Saturday, the twenty-ninth of April, seven hundred and fifty paroled Louisianians from Lee's army were brought here, the sole survivors of ten regiments who left four years ago so full of hope and determination. On the twenty-ninth of April, 1861, George left New Orleans with his regiment. On the fourth anniversary of that day they came back, 
but George and Gibbs have long been lying in their graves. June 15th. Our Confederacy has gone with one crash, the report of the pistol fired at Lincoln. End of Book 5 End of A Confederate Girl's Diary by Sarah Morgan Dawson